All right. How's everybody doing? Yeah? This is Nicholas. He really wanted to be on stage. Say hello. So now I'm going to introduce a speaker, um, and he's become a really close friend. Yes. And he's a really good friend, and we met only a couple of weeks ago, and he's going to talk about love. Oh, he wants a picture over there. Там есть картинка. Вот это. So, I want to introduce Skinner. Skinner, come on up. He's going to speak about love, and that's why I wanted to bring Nicholas here. And I think startups miss a lot of the feelings, so we're going to be talking about that. He wants a question for you. Best introduction ever. <laughs> All right. Wrong way. Say that again. So thank you very much. Now we're going to talk about love. And Skinner, the floor is yours. Thank you. I met Skinner a couple of weeks ago, and it was one of the most inspiration talks I've ever heard in my life. And that's why I just couldn't do anything but to invite you here to RD15 thank and you. do this talk. So please, the floor is yours, and we're going to go in the audience and listen to you. All right, thank you. So I want to know... Uh, those of you who are listening, how many of you think that you're going to fail in your current startup or endeavor? How many of you think that you're going to fail? Okay, I see a group that does not know how to do statistics at all. Now, the reason I ask you this is that we, in, we as entrepreneurs, in order to do the things that we do, we have to convince ourselves that we are the exception to the rule. We actually have to suspend disbelief that everything we're doing isn't going to be a miserable failure, even though, statistically speaking, it will be. And I want to encourage you to be honest with yourself about your inevitable failure because it might get you to organize your life just a little bit differently. So the theme that I'm going around and talking to people about is that startups are dead. Um, and today's talk is a sort of continuation of this theme, which is what's love got to do with it? So I'm going to use a definition of love that I read uh, over 10 years ago, that love is the will to extend oneself for the growth of another person. And I think that love is the thing that startups and entrepreneurs are missing the most in their life, and the thing that would radically transform everything that you are doing if you actually took the time and energy to invest in love. So why, why am I at a startup conference talking about love? Well, the main reason is that most of you are going to fail. And so I don't want all of your effort, all of your time to be a waste. Because if, you're, if what you're doing only brings you fulfillment if you reach the ultimate goal, then most of this time is going to be a waste. And you're going to get to the end of it, and you're going to have relatively little to show other than some lessons learned. But it doesn't have to be this way. And, you know, I, I spent my I've spent my life on a very strange path. I, I started out in software startups and had some success and some failure. And at the end of one of those failures, I went and spent three years living in the mountains, reading books and thinking because I was rather impacted by that failure. I didn't want to just jump up and start doing it again. And so when I finally decided to leave the mountains, I made a commitment to myself. And that commitment was that whatever I do, each day has to have been worth it, even if I fail in the end. Each day has to have been worth living and has to have had something to show for it even if, it, even if everything else is wiped away by the failure later. And love is at the root of this, because love is a 
characterization of the relationships that you have with other people. Now, how many of you think that you can succeed in your endeavor without any other people involved? Anybody think that you can have a, a huge success in life completely alone? So we know, even if we don't talk about it, that our lives are inextricably linked to our relationships with other people. We can't get around other people. They're there, and they have to be there, and even if we don't admit it, we want them to be there. We want to do the things that we do with people we care about. We want to do the things that we do with people who are genuinely concerned about us as humans, and not just as commodities to be traded. Now, unfortunately, when you come to a startup conference, and you do you know, speed dating, and you meet with investors, and so on, we, we, we treat each other like commodities. What, what do you have to give me right now that benefits my current very narrow uh, business operation? Do you have money? Do you have people that might buy things from me? No? Okay, I don't want to talk to you. And if you do, the extent of our relationship is only going to be around those things. And the reality of investing is that investors don't care about your success. They care about their success. So if you're out here raising money, an investor takes an interest in you, and you think, oh good, I found an ally. They're going to be your ally until you don't seem like a promising prospect anymore, even after they've invested money in you. Because investors are playing the lottery but they're buying lots of lottery tickets. And the way they do this is they convince you to put all of your money on one lottery ticket. And so then they get to benefit if one of their lottery tickets pays off. But if you aren't one of them, and we know statistically you aren't going to be, then they don't care about you anymore. And you're going to find yourself having failed and you will probably be alone because that's usually where, how failure happens. But there's a way to avoid that, and that is by investing more in the relationships with the people around you than you are right now, probably a lot more. So if we go back to our definition of love, what this means is that you have to be willing to listen to other people, the people you work with. You know, one of the mysteries of life to me is that we know that we're going to spend far more time with the people we work with than the people that we live with. Like, statistically speaking, you, the people you work with are the more significant relations in your life with respect to time. I mean, you're, you know you're going to spend a lot more time working than having sex. Like, that's pretty obvious to everybody in the room, right? So, why do we not spend the time to invest in the relationships with the people who are going to occupy most of our time and whose success in life is probably most linked to our own? To me, this is just not being very dedicated to the realities in which we find ourselves. So, listening to other people, though, is very inefficient, it seems, in the short term. You know, sitting down with people and understanding the root of their problems, rather than just, you know, the frenzy of, of so-called productivity, the busyness that we find ourselves constantly engaged in, it's actually more efficient to set aside a large block of time every day, every week, for everybody to be honest with each other about what's going on. You know, the reason that you're, the people you work with aren't as productive as you want them to be is all in their head. The reason you aren't as productive as you want to be is all in your head. You're limited in your capacity to produce things for the world because you are limited in your capacity to understand yourself and to be understood by others. Because all of the things that you actually produce are the result of what you do with other people. So if you don't understand them, and they don't understand you at a human level, you're only going to get a certain level of superficial productivity. 
And, and there's really no way around this. But in business, we're particularly afraid of anybody getting to know us. You know, if you, if you look at people's, you know, personal brands, the, the, the image that they want other people to see, it's very disconnected with the human reality in which we live. And we're afraid that somebody, I, I, and I think this is a universal human feeling, that we're afraid somebody might actually see us for who we are. So we don't want to go looking for other people to find out who they really are, because we're actually, it's not that we want to be understood, we're terrified of somebody knowing us that well. And that's why Peck says in that definition of love that it's an extension of oneself. You actually have to put yourself out there. You have to stretch yourself in order to grow and in order to help other people to grow. And you know, when it comes to the resources that we have in life to achieve the things we want to achieve, we have a limited amount of time. Time is, is this very difficult resource for us because we know it's limited, but we don't know how limited it is. We don't know when we're going to run out of time. And when you spend time, you don't get more time. You can't spend time to buy more time. When it comes to money, also finite resource for most people, you at least know how much money you have and you have some rough idea of when you're going to run out of it. But again, you can't spend money to get money. You may, it may be a necessary condition of making money, but spending money is not a sufficient condition to make money, right? You can't just go take your money and go to the money store and buy more money than you put in. It doesn't work this way. But love is the resource that we have that every time we spend it, we get more than we put in. It's always a, a positive sum encounter. If you stretch yourself for somebody else's benefit, even if they don't enjoy the benefit, even if they reject it, you have still gained something because you are bigger than you were before. You have a greater capacity than you had before just by virtue of extending yourself for that other person. And so love is actually the only thing that we have in life that when we use it, we get more of it, no matter what. It's the only guaranteed investment you can make in life that the return is always there. But it will always seem at the margin like there is no return. And this is the problem with it. Because when you look at the pure cost-benefit analysis of sitting down and putting yourself out there to help somebody else, you say, but I could be doing these other things that have a bigger short-term payoff. And what really is the payoff? You know, you can't quantify it. You can't quantify the value of you having a greater capacity to suffer and to understand other humans. You, you, it doesn't fit into a spreadsheet. And yet, it is probably the thing that will make those numbers in the spreadsheet grow more over time than anything else that you do. So, at a certain level, you have to engage in an act of faith. And faith is not about beliefs. Faith is about trusting that whatever you're doing is going to pay out even in spite of the fact that there's no evidence to believe that. So, at the beginning, you know, all but two of you didn't raise your hand when I said, how many of you think you're going to fail? Only two people raised their hand. So you're all already acting on the basis of faith that your startup or endeavor is going to pay out even though the odds are stacked way against you. But I'm telling you that every time you extend yourself for another person, it always does pay out. The statistics are 100%, not 0.2%. And yet, we don't have the faith to do this because we're rushing around too much caught up in our everyday busyness. And it's hard to break 
that, that pattern. You know, basically, modern life works like this. You don't get enough sleep, so you wake up tired. You go and you drink coffee. And caffeine is proven to reduce our levels of empathy. So we drink caffeine, we then start treating, you know, and we're tired, so we kind of treat each other badly throughout the day, the people we spend most of our life with, remember. And then we go home at the end of the day, frustrated, angry, exhausted, and we want to forget that people were mean to us and that we were mean to other people, so we medicate this with alcohol, which disrupts our REM sleep, and we wake up the next morning tired, and we repeat the cycle again. And, you know, we're not very honest about our dependence on drugs because it, alcohol and caffeine are, are the two most popular and ubiquitous drugs on the planet. They are chemicals that alter your brain chemistry. And we're dependent on them even though they make us dumber and lower our empathy levels with other people. And it's, it's a self-reinforcing cycle. And so to, to take the time to break ourselves out of the cycle of busyness, out of the compulsion to be productive, we're actually laying aside the keys to our greater longer-term success. Now, what I can tell you is that if you and a small group of people genuinely care about each other and are willing to continually, day after day, put yourself out there for each other's growth, over time, you will protect yourself against that ultimate final failure. You may find yourself in a series of failed experiments, but you're not deserted and alone. You know, most people, when their startup fails, everybody goes their separate ways. They scatter, they say, I don't want to see any more of you. And so then you have to start over from scratch but actually not from scratch. It's not like a blank slate when you fail. You start over with all of this emotional baggage, maybe a lot of financial debt, and probably a lot of burned bridges. You know, if you raised money and you fail, and you lose your investors all their money, I bet you they're not going to be thrilled to see you the next time you run into them. You know, they, they may not punch you in the face, but I bet they're not going to be happy to see you. They're probably not going to rush to throw some more money at you. So when you fail, you, you start over in a worse position than when you started to begin with. And if you're also alone, it's really tough to keep going, to start all over again. Because when you finish with failure, it's like, and then you start again. I can tell you from experience, if you haven't been through it, it's like the feeling of putting on wet socks that you wore the day before. Everything you do has this sort of uncomfortable feeling, this reminder of that hope that was dashed. Everything you do, every email you send reminds you just a little bit of that horrible feeling. And so we start, when we restart after failure, we flinch a lot. You know, every little thing that happens, we kind of jump back, saying, no, I, I don't want to go through that again. Just like if you've ever taken a cold shower, you know, you, you get in and then you, you jump back. And we, we have this sort of reaction to things that have caused us emotional pain in the past. But if we've taken the time to invest our lives day after day in the, the growth and well-being of other people, even when you fail, even when you find yourself in that position of saying, well, we have to start over from square one, if you don't desert each other, you have a much higher probability of succeeding the next time. And in this case, you don't start over in a worse position. You start over maybe even in a better position because now you know each other better already. You don't have to go and restart new working relationships with strangers. You already know what you need to work on as individuals and as a group. And you start over with that as an asset, where those relationships are the asset that you get to invest in the restart. Now, most people don't 
most people who succeed didn't succeed the first time. There are very, very few exceptions to this rule. Most people fail several times before they succeed, and those are the people that have some fire inside that they can't put out, and so they're willing to go through this pain again and again. If you don't have that, then not only will you fail now, but you won't ever have that success in the future. But I promise you, your odds of getting going again, if it's not alone, are a lot higher. But this, these kind of relationships are not easy to build, because it means that you can't ever avoid a problem. You can't ignore your problems. You can't ignore underlying disagreements. You can't keep your mouth shut just to keep the peace. You can't be quiet just to get the job done. You can't go around just worrying about being right. You actually have to put aside what you want. You have to put aside those short-term incentives and say, "Okay, look, we have to talk about this. This is a problem." The way you're treating the employees, you can't keep doing this. They're all quit. Why? Why are you treating people like this? Okay, so well because you did this to me and I'm stuck with this. Ah, okay. Now suddenly we have to deal with this conflict that we both knew we had, but we weren't willing to pull that bandage off and expose the wound. And the number of those covered-up wounds that we're all carrying around in our work life. Probably, if they were actually on our body, would cover us from head to toe. And so, the only way to heal those wounds is to first expose them. You have to know where they are and what they are, and then sit down and solve them together. But this means exposing yourself, and that's why love is this extension, because it hurts. Pulling that bandage off and showing that you're wounded, that you're vulnerable, that you're weak. That you are scared. This is totally the opposite of everything that we are supposed to be, and yet it is the thing that we all universally are, and just don't want to admit. And so we carry around these wounds, unwilling to heal them, unwilling to help others heal them, and they just compound. You know, the reason that leprosy was a terrifying disease. For most of human history, is that it it destroys your ability, your nerves' ability to feel. So, like you could break your leg and walk around on a broken leg and feel nothing. You could put your hand in a fire and not feel like you were getting burned. And so, this destroys you very quickly if you can't feel pain. And the same is true of our emotional wounds. If we can't feel them, if we don't allow ourselves to feel them, we just keep walking around on them every day. They will destroy us. So, I'm trying to encourage you to take life more honestly, to take the realities of your probability of success more honestly, to take more honestly the the number of hours you know you're going to spend with these people at your place of work, and deal with them. In a proactive way, say, "I want the totality of my life to be meaningful and uplifting. I don't want to have to pay this massive price and toll in order to get just a little bit of gold at the end of some rainbow, only to find that there is no rainbow and there is no gold. But the real treasure is actually right in front of you." It's already there. You already have access to it in the people who you are spending your time with today. You don't need to find new people. You just need to understand them in a new way, and to let them understand you in a new way. And this is not.、Um, th- this is also the opposite of kind of you know woo-woo hippie. Everybody likes each other kind of stuff. This is the opposite of that. This is hey, we have a real problem. I know that I'm doing this over and over. I need your help, and I see that you're doing this and this over and over, and you need to work on it. You have to be combative in your love. You can't be shy. You can't just try to get along. It's not about that. Ralph Waldo Emerson 
in, uh, in an essay entitled Friendship. He says, I do not wish to treat friendships, I do, he says that I do not wish to treat friendships daintily, but with the roughest courage. And I believe that this is what love calls us to do, to treat our relationships with other people with courage, not to be afraid of what we might expose of ourselves. So I want to leave you with the words of a poem that has been me very meaningful to me for my life. It is called A Psalm of Life by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. He says, tell me not in mournful numbers life is but an empty dream, for the soul is dead that slumbers and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal, from dust thou art to dust returnest, was not spoken of the soul. Not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way, but to act that each tomorrow finds us farther than today. Art is long and time is fleeting, and our hearts, though stout and brave, still, like muffled drums are beating, funeral marches to the grave. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb, driven cattle. Be a hero in the strife. Trust no future, however pleasant. Let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present, heart within and God or head. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another, sailing o'er life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother, seeing may take heart again. Let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. Thank you all. Thank you so much. I think uh, we have time for one question. Great. Uh, anybody in the audience have a question for Skinner here? We, we, in Finland, we're a little bit shy sometimes. It's okay. It takes about 30 seconds usually. Oh, there's one at the back. The, you'll get a microphone in about four seconds, maybe five. Yeah, so you talk a lot about like uh, emotions, so how important is it according to you to like visualize something big and like feel, feel really strong about it instead of just doing hard work? Um, so actually what I, uh, the practice that I do in order to, uh, to bring that out more is that every morning for, bet, for between 30 minutes to two hours, and I know this sounds like a lot of time, but between 30 minutes and two hours, I get up and I pour every single thought that I have, every feeling, emotion that I have, every state of mind into a journal. And I notice, you know, okay, here are the problems. Here, here are the things that are clouding me from getting what I want to be accomplished or want to bring out into the world today. These are the barriers. And if they're my problem, then I will talk them through until I come to maybe not permanent resolution, but to set them aside and, and understand they're there. And if they're problems with other people, to say, you know, literally when I stand up from the table, all right, I've got to talk to this person. And so I, I think that if you want to, to deal with these feelings or states of mind, whatever they may be, you need to, you need to first understand them. And, and writing them out is, for me at least, have been the, the most productive way of doing that. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.